नमस्कार मैं हूं पुरुषोत्तम अग्रवाल आज से राज्यसभा टीवी एक नया साप्ताहिक कार्यक्रम शुरू करने जा रहा है किताब इस कार्यक्रम के हर एपिसोड में हम किसी महत्वपूर्ण किताब के बारे में उसके लेखक संपादक या उस विषय के जानकार के साथ बातचीत करेंगे आज इस पहले एपिसोड में जिस किताब पर हम बात करने जा रहे हैं वो दस साल पहले अपने प्रकाशन से लेकर आज तक लगातार चर्चा में बनी रही है लगातार उस पर बातचीत होती रही है और उस किताब के लेखक इस समय दुनिया के जाने माने चुनिंदा विद्वानों और विचारकों में माने जाते हैं और साथ ही वो एक पब्लिक इंटेलेक्चुअल भी हैं दी आर्ग्यूमेंटेटिव इंडियन नोबेल पुरस्कार विजेता और मशहूर अर्थशास्त्री प्रोफेसर अमर्त सेन की मशहूर किताबों में से एक है देश दुनिया की बेहतरीन किताबों के फहरिस्त में शुमार की जाने वाली यह किताब उन्नीस से 2005 के बीच लिखे गए निबंधों का संकलन है भारत रत्न प्रोफेसर सेन ने इस किताब में भारतीय इतिहास के साथ बौद्धिक बहुलतावाद का बड़ी ही खूबसूरती से जिक्र किया है उन्होंने इसमें जिज्ञासा वाद विवाद और संवाद की भारतीय परंपरा पर गहन विचार किया है किताब में वैदिक युग से लेकर मौजूदा भारत और रविंद्रनाथ टैगोर के साहित्य से लेकर सत्यजित रे के सिनेमा तक के संदर्भ आते हैं प्रोफेसर सेन ने इस किताब को चार मुख्य हिस्सों में बांटा है पहला हिस्सा वॉइस एंड हेटर ओडोक्सी पर जबकि दूसरा हिस्सा कल्चर एंड कम्युनिकेशन पर है तीसरे हिस्से में उन्होंने पॉलिटिक्स एंड प्रोटेस्ट और चौथे हिस्से में रीजन और आइडेंटिटी पर जोर दिया है आमतौर से माना गया है कि भारत धार्मिक भावनाओं और आस्थाओं से ओतप्रोत धन प्राण समाज रहा है लेकिन प्रोफेसर सेन ने इस किताब में यह साबित करने की कोशिश की है कि भारत केवल धन प्राण ही नहीं बल्कि तर्क प्रधान समाज भी रहा है वास्तविकता यह है कि गहन धार्मिक आस्थाओं के साथ साथ भारत में बुनियादी सवालों की भी प्रबल परंपरा रही है इन सवालों का दायरा सृष्टि की रचना और रचयिता से लेकर मानव स्वभाव और सामाजिक संरचनाओं की बनावट तक व्याप्त है प्रोफेसर सेन की यह किताब भारतीय परंपरा के भुला दिए गए पहलुओं को फिर से खोजने और रेखांकित करने की व्यापक बौद्धिक कोशिश का हिस्सा है साथ ही भारत की तर्क परंपराओं का रेखांकन भारत के वर्तमान और भविष्य की बेहतरी के लिए जरूरी है ये हमारा सौभाग्य है बहुत बड़ा सौभाग्य है कि इस पहले एपिसोड के लिए आज हमारे साथ इस किताब पर बात करने के लिए पुस्तक के लेखक विश्वविख्यात अर्थशास्त्री और इंटेलेक्चुअल प्रोफेसर अमर्त सेन स्वयं मौजूद हैं थैंक यू सो मच प्रोफेसर सेन एंड वेलकम टू दिस प्रोग्राम ऑफ राज्यसभा टीवी किताब प्रोफेसर सेन आई वुड लाइक टू बिगिन विद दी बेसिक इंक्वायरी दीज एस एज वर रिटर्न बिटवीन नाइनटीन नाइन्टी फाइव एंड टू थाउजेंड फाइव वाई डिड यू फील द नीड टू अंडरलाइन दी आर्ग्यूमेंटेटिव इंडियन इन दिस पर्टिकुलर पीरियड Secondly related question don't you think that the shrinking space of rationality is not merely an indian issue these days but actually a global issue well beginning with the second absolutely i totally agree so in some ways when i was addressing the uh, argumentative nature of indian history and how much in india had benefited from it i was also making a global point that uh, you see in some ways every every tradition has some argumentative feature right we are very um um lucky in uh, having a lot of argument writing them down and you know uh, india is a very verbal society we like speaking <laughs> people often say uh iliad odyssey Rama and Mahabharat similar epic now Mahabharat is more than seven times earlier yeah. than all these people put together <laughs> yeah one book so i think we like with their debates and if you take think of opposite point of views for example in ramayana when uh, javali is disputing ram's view um 
he's saying, look, this is not right. You shouldn't, you should govern the country rather than go away. Uh, and giving a reason, Ram ultimately doesn't get persuaded and in fact uh, says, look, uh, this is evil, I won't accept. But before it says it's evil, there's a long discourse as to what the argument is. Right. I think that's the tradition of India which, of which I've been proud of. I was very happy to have the opportunity of having Sanskrit basically as my second language when I was growing up next to Bengali. Uh, I was lucky in the sense my uh, grandfather with whom I was staying, these were wartime. My father, who was a professor at Dhaka, thought that uh, Dhaka would be bombed. So I was uh, dispatched to Santaniketan where my grandfather was teaching and Sanskrit was, a, you know, who was a great Sanskritist. So growing up, I had this opportunity of really getting quite deep into Sanskrit literature. Ultimately, even Vedic literature, I did read the Rig Vedas with the greatest of interest, and a bit of the Ottawa Veda and so on. But basically, my, my thing was the, was the classical yeah. Sanskrit. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Kalidas, Vana. The epics and... Uh, Sudraka, yeah, yeah the, 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 the golden era yeah. of, right, of right. classical Sanskrit. And if you think of a play like uh, Michakatika, right. Little Clay Card, right. I, I think it's very hard to think of another play which has a similar range of different kinds of arguments. Uh, ultimately, it's a, it's, a, it's a revolutionary argument. They don't like the regime. Uh, and the Charudatta, the hero, doesn't was on the Sena, and actually that's also the distribute the hero in is actually a courtesan right. and not frowned upon for that. And she gives good intellectual arguments too. So there's an attempt to kill them, uh, but they want the regime to change and ultimately the regime falls. But uh, when Charudatta is asked to judge what to do with a person who is trying to kill him, uh, he uses a lovely Sanskrit word, Upaka uh, Hatastakatavya. It's our duty to kill him by benefaction. Yeah. Now that's a peculiarly complicated thought. That's right, sir. Because, and so he let him go. He is, of course, overwhelmed. But uh, you can see even from the last part, this is how the play ends, that he thinks that what you ought to do is not to um, carry out a revenge killing, but to do that which will make the society go best. That's a very unusual thought for a fourth century AD thing. So I thought that those arguments, those debates, and this is a debate because Charudatta would have been absolutely right to kill this guy because he had made several attempts to kill Charudatta and Vasantasena, but he didn't. So I think the, those debates, similarly Vrta's conversations with Ananda, Subhuti, and so on, I spent hours and hours reading them. And I thought that um, we got huge amounts from our past in this respect. Uh, not, uh, you know, uh, uh, not so much the religiosity, but the discussion, the debate. And, uh, and I think we needed that even more in the contemporary yeah, right, world. Right. And that's why you asked, to, I come to the first question now, why was I writing that? Because I was feeling that I, I, well, I was con convinced, it's not a matter of feeling, I thought that the argumentative benefaction of India had been underestimated. Right. And, uh, um, you know, it's a, it's a big, big issue where, that yeah. you, uh, you want to win an argument perhaps, but you also want to give a good argument and you want to hear the argument on the other side. You see, this is a, this comes up in Western civilization too, that sometimes people would agree ultimately to the same conclusion, but for different arguments, and that's a different way of thinking about it. And I think this has happened to uh, Immanuel Kant, uh, Adam Smith, um, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, the pioneering feminist, and so on. So I think, um, we have something really valuable, which I thought we were not valuing adequately. And there was a case for me to write a book. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
जैसा कि प्रोफेसर सेन ने हम लोगों को याद दिलाया वैसे हम सब जानते ही हैं कि हम हिंदुस्तानी लोग बातें करने के और बहस करने के बहुत रसिया हैं और इसीलिए ये बातचीत भी केवल मेरे और प्रोफेसर सेन के बीच में नहीं होने जा रही है हमारे साथ कुछ और मित्र हैं हमारे साथ देश के लीडिंग इंटेलेक्चुअल्स हैं प्रोफेसर मृदुला मुखर्जी हैं सिद्धार्थ वरद राजन हैं उर्मिलेश हैं और बहुत सारे जिज्ञासु नौजवान हैं जो प्रोफेसर सेन से सवाल करेंगे बट बिफोर दैट कमिंग बैक टू यू सर यू मैंसनड अबाउट दिस ट्रेडिशन ऑफ इंडियन आर्ग्यूमेंटेटिवनेस but uh, here is a question in which uh, i i felt this rather yeah. intriguing and incidentally since you mentioned your grandfather yeah so in a sense i am also related with the professor k m sen because he was a colleague of hajari prasad devedi oh yes hajari a, a prasad great, devedi a, a, hajari <laughs> prasad devedi was the professor of my professor yeah. so i am also a grandchild of k m sen yeah. so, <laughs> so so i knew him very well <laughs> thank you so professor sen in this book also and i i could expect that basically you are talking of the tradition of argumentation with reference to sanskrit sources but in india particularly in the early modern period we have a huge tradition yeah. of argumentation through vernacular languages yes you have mentioned of course you have mentioned people like kabir and mirabai and raidas but still the main body of your argument main body of your recounting or reappraisal of india's argumentative tradition uh, draws from sanskrit and this i find rather you know problematic and <laughs> yeah. again coming to the contemporary issues like secularism and all that yeah. most in fact almost all the references are from the intellectuals who are writing in english so my question is twofold now that why did you ignore the vernacular tradition of argumentation while a lot of good translations are available at least of kabir raidas and mirabai and tukaram and uh, why why is this i mean was this a deliberate choice or it was your no, limitation or whatever i am arguing that that's not the case <laughs> <laughs> okay you see partly there's a language issue here yeah uh, the language i'm very familiar with the vernacular is bengali of course yeah going back to chaudhapat in the 10th century right i think i know pretty much all the literature yeah. of that period and chandidas and so on um and the um i made a lot of views of that uh, some of them in this book it's it's a essay written in english yeah, but but as i told you yeah. the main body of your no, collection draws from the nada that's I what i'm saying that's I what i'm saying that. it's mainly from such sources because you see the influences are uh if it's on the with the sagar on on why right and so on uh, and there there was in bengali yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. uh when chandi das says shobhay hmm. upay manushot tatah upay right. nai right that the, the greatest truth is human being right there is that no is truth das. higher than that right it's a very radical thought and uh, he could be hold in court for some reason or other every insult <laughs> yeah, something yeah. or other these days <laughs> in the present tradition but how are we man who shot to how we nai is a vernacular thought uh, and uh, the um, when kadi nazrul islam started his uh, bengali magazine which was a radical magazine he had that quote from chandidas right. as the top thief every number So these have been very much a part of my thing. Now, when I write in an English uh, journal, and argumentative Indian is a book in English, yeah, right. I also write in Bengali. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Then in Bengali writings, I quote more Bengali sources. Yeah. Now, my familiarity with Kabir's language is less, but uh, I also had the opportunity of sitting with Devendra Ji and Kriti Mohan Sen Ji. on that. And you know there is a debate on that which is relevant to it because later on the Kabi study I think took a turn for the worse. What happened is that he was neglected for a long time, but Kabi belonged to a living tradition, and there were a whole lot of Gharanas and so on. As uh, you may or may not know, that came. With humility, and, I can say that I am a Kabir student myself. Yeah, you can. So I am no, quite aware of living tradition of Kabir. Came then, came then. Yes. Actually, took swearing at the age of twenty, right, and became a Kabirist. 
That's the only religion he has ever had. Often he thought to be one more, but he was never that. Yeah. And he did not do anything else, because we were the only thing he had. But you see, he always gave priority to what you can pick up from the, um, uh, in Bengali word, the fertility to what right. the ongoing uh, tradition. Now then came a lot of very scholarly people who said, no, well, we don't know originally what was there, etc. But you see, you can't judge a tradition like Kavir, which was all the time evolving. Divedidi, Hazari Prasad Divedi, wrote a wonderful thing in his book Kavir, commenting on Kritiman Sen's priority to go for the oral rural, sources, rural oral sources, and the urban, oral sources. So on that side. And if you look at my, um, it's not here, but if you look at the book called Hinduism, which he wrote, which Penguin published, is still I, I, one I, of the more I, I, widely read book on Hinduism, I, I wrote a foreword to it. In this, I discussed the, the, the whole Kavi I know. connection. And in that connection, it's a very vernacular connection. There couldn't be any. Yeah. So I think in some ways, the urbanization of Kavi that happened in the ongoing literature, if you go to a University of California and read something on Kabir, you would get only those things which are authenticated, published, and therefore undermine the vernacular tradition. And Kirivan Sen, of course, was very uh, committed to that approach, yeah. but he was never an argumentative himself. I mean, he was argumentative, but he never liked to debate. But Divedi took that on. In, in his book on Kabir, discuss why is it that came since tradition yeah. has important. Uh, 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 the argumentative tradition in Indian society or anywhere uh, could not have sustained itself without the institutions. You have mentioned Nalanda, Vikram Sila, Takshu Sila and all that. And then you had the benefit of living in Cambridge when the atmosphere was thick with the presence or at least memories of people like Wittgenstein and Turing and all that. And on the other hand, you have Santi Niketan connection, Ramindranath Thakur, Kriti Monsen and others. You have been visiting India quite often. You have been interacting with some of the institutions. You were also associated with a dream of revival of Nalanda. Sir, what do you think of the health of academic institutions in India today? Well, I'm worried. I'm worried because on one side, the country is uh, full of money, and we can uh, spend a lot of money. Uh, and you know, when there is a, a generous um, support, you can do a lot. I mean, I, when I was coming from uh, uh, Calcutta yesterday, I happened to travel with the Vice Chancellor of Jindal University. Now, the 500 crores of manufacturing that, uh, that the kindly gender family gave, of course, made it possible for him to do many things, which was hard for Nalanda to carry out with the kind of particularly uh, somewhat often somewhat mean-minded scrutiny that went with it. I mean, scrutiny is a very good thing, and accountability is extremely important. But when there is a certain angle, and it isn't the present government angle, it was actually, to some extent, bureaucracy of the, of the, of the Ministry of External Affairs versus academia. That's a big debate, too. Yeah. At the moment, there may be a particular vision that the present government is thought to have, and then that raises the question, is that a sufficiently broad vision? And that's the second question. So all these issues are there. Am I concerned? Yes. Now. This is not because it's never, uh, we have never had difficulties in the past. After all, academic tradition in India has developed under the rigors of the colonial rule. Presidency College, where I was, for, you skipped that, between yeah. Santi <laughs> yeah. and, and Cambridge, I was yeah, in Cam Presidency, Presidency College. Also, yes. what, what people overlook, uh, the Presidency College was started not by the government, but by it was the civil society initiative. Right. It was the uh, it was the uh, the affluent in Calcutta, uh, Bengali, as well as some Englishmen, like Hyde, 
but uh, mostly local Bengali community, which played a huge part in, in but, that. But I'm sorry. And, and, and in, in that, um, we have succeeded in, uh, in establishing standards and, and work, again, after all, Shotzen Bose, uh, Meghnaad Shah, uh, P.C. Roy, uh, P.C. Mahalan Abbas, all these works came uh, against um, quite a rigorous uh, colonial rule, and they were all opposed to their <laughs> rule. Sir, sir, because it is because of such nostalgia and such memory that being an academic myself, the present uh, not only bothers but actually frightens me. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you must be aware we are talking a lot of intolerance these days. And my next question is about that. Yes. I mean, can really be an increasingly intolerant society retain its argumented tradition? Can it really have the kind of academic institutions that one used to have like presidency, Swanti Niketan, or just uh, 20 or 30 years ago, JNE? Can we really continue to have that uh, academic vibrance? That would, that would be very serious if the country was really to intolerant. I don't believe the country is intolerant. Okay. I think we have to make a distinction right. between uh, intolerant governance and, and intolerance the on the part of sources of money. Right. I mean, when I was, you know, I eventually left Nalanda on grounds that it was clear to me that if I, you see, the board was unanimously elected and re-elected me, wanted me to fight on, especially the foreign members from China, Japan, Singapore, Thailand. But it seemed to me it's not in the best interest of Nalanda because those who controlled the purse, namely the government, were keen on getting me out and we can do some way, and we have done a good thing, former uh, foreign minister of, uh, uh, of Singapore, George Yeo, is, is a good, very good chancellor, uh, uh, succeeding me. So I persuaded George to agree to that, and I was happy to move I was not happy to move on because I've been going to Nalanda since I was 11 with my <laughs> grandfather. Yeah. It had been my lifetime dream, but I've done something. But I thought that um, it was much more important that because of me, Nalon, that doesn't get into right. uh, a kind of starvation diet. And, and I think with Giorgio, we may be able to avoid that. We have to see. And, uh, you know, in some ways, the test is yet to come. So I think uh, if you're frightened, I'm frightened too. I don't like saying frightened because, you know, fright is never a good way of fighting any battle. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to recognize the challenge. Right. We have to have the conviction that right. we would win. And I think, ultimately, we have to rely on the fact that the society is not intolerant. You know, you say there is intolerant. Contrast this. In a court in India, Ram is being sued on grounds of having yeah. been unfair to Sita. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, it's possible one of the Ram Bhaktas would do some harm to this guy. But the courts have entertained that. And then there's the question of how can you uh, continue in that. I think the society has a lot of tolerance. You know, uh, uh, political change here has been suddenly very rapid. Suddenly so you are, I'm sorry, but you are making a very important distinction, and I completely agree with you intolerance on part of certain political tendencies yes. and intolerance in society as such. And I agree with you, sir, that uh, society as such is not actually intolerant. No. But well, the political tendencies are one thing that's okay, that's there. I, I would like to ask you another question. Uh, after the argumentative Indian, we had this idea of justice and then uh, uncertain glory. And now, though I have not yet read it, uh, I believe your latest book is about memories, recollections. It's from age zero. <laughs> I've just about got to 13. Yeah. <laughs> so, now, what, uh, what I was just uh, looking forward, can we expect a sequel to argumentative Indian and to the idea of justice in uh, near future? I don't think, I think the book stands on its own and I wouldn't. But you know, uh, just uh, related a little to the last question. I think, um, uh, just to make my point, that 
a political change here has happened like a storm suddenly. I think there is a tradition whereby we have been just too tolerant or intolerant. Thank you. That would be my thesis. It's not that we are intolerant, the society is tolerant, but it's even tolerant or intolerant. Yeah. Somehow it's not our problem. But it is our problem. Yeah. अब हम एक ब्रेक लेंगे ब्रेक के बाद प्रोफेसर सैन से जैसा मैंने आपसे कहा यहाँ बैठे लोग बातचीत करेंगे उसमें हमारे साथ हैं प्रोफेसर मृदुला मुखर्जी सिद्धार्थ वरदराजा नॉर्मलेस और बहुत सारे जोशीले और जिज्ञासु नौजवान बात जारी रखते हैं ब्रेक के बाद प्रोफेसर सैन ने अपनी पुस्तक आर्ग्यूमेंटेटिव इंडियन में भारत की प्रश्न परंपरा में स्त्रियों की स्थिति को रेखांकित करते हुए एक बहुत दिलचस्प बात कही है कि याज्ञ वल्क से मैत्रेयी वृहदर्णय को उपनिषद में पूछती हैं कि जिस समृद्धि से मुझे अमरता ना मिले जीवन की सार्थकता ना मिले उस समृद्धि का मैं करूँगी क्या और प्रोफेसर सैन ने लिखा है कि ये जो सवाल था ये जिस तरह का इकोनॉमिक्स मैंने किया जिस तरह की रिसर्च मैंने की उसके लिए एक मोटिवेशन था मैं अपने साथियों से ये कहूँगा कि इस किताब के संदर्भ में प्रोफेसर सैन के पूरे काम के और उसके महत्व के संदर्भ में खासकर आर्ग्यूमेंटेटिव इंडियन के संदर्भ में प्रोफेसर सैन से हम लोग अब बात करेंगे इस सेगमेंट में और सबसे पहले प्रोफेसर मृदुला मुखर्जी जानी मानी इतिहासकार और जे में प्रोफेसर प्रोफेसर मृदुला मुखर्जी आप वेल एन अपॉर्चुनिटी टू आस्क यू अ क्वेश्चन बट अ वेरी लिमिटेड वन टू आस्क यू वन क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम ऑल द हंड्रेड्स वन कुड थिंक ऑफ माय क्वेश्चन इज दैट यू आल्सो हैव सेड दैट इट इज दोज टाइम्स इन इंडियन हिस्ट्री वेन दिस ट्रेडिशन इन अ सेंस इज मोर पावरफुल एंड इवन हेजमोनिक आर द टाइम्स वेन there is the greatest amount of original thinking scientific creativity and you make this argument with reference to our ancient past so my question is how do you then see uh, our recent past and even today in terms of where do we stand vis-a-vis -vis this tradition do you see this phase of our contemporary life as being one in which this tradition is powerful and hegemonic or it's there but being contested strongly and being attempted to be pushed back and therefore also likely to affect our ability to actually innovate and be creative and be the great uh india that we claim that we want to be and you know rule the 21st century do are these contradictory yeah it's a very good question um, i think um, to um um make a full statement of my position is not so much when there have been hegemonic rule there have been different kind of hegemonic rules the hegemonic rules which have established an order like ashoka did and agwa did and at the same time remain deeply tolerant these have been ideal times and so i think we need the the uh, the uh, the 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 discipline that comes from um good uh governance and sense of security that the population had you see if you think about indian history tend to go to moria because established the empire but it's really under a focus that the whole thing seemed settled and of course then he made the mistake of attacking kalinga and we don't know dialectically may not have been a mistake it made me him think about something a lot of people got killed but he thought about something which became very important in his mind and he then wanted to encourage people to express their point of view not to stifle them and so on put little stone things everywhere on that so that so if you i think the question that we set them was raising uh if i may call you for that it's an honor sir yeah uh, that um if if he is some frightened he is frightened by the fact that he he doesn't see that level of tolerance he is afraid that is not there so that is really the concern 
But first of also made another point that which is not so central to the argumentative Indian, but is present there, even there, but is present in my other writings, including Bengali writing, that there had been a, a tradition which was in the vernacular tradition, which has come in a period of considerable turmoil. If you think about the time of Dadu, Kabir, Meabai, uh, Ramdas, all that time, uh, there was a lot of things going on. The Baals in Bengal survived through very hard times. So I think um, we have to um, also recognize that. And in today's world, that's also partly a political process. Now, if you think of the Western tradition, on one side, you have the classical tradition, derived from Latin and Greek, and the, and the great schools, and the, and the, the Kants, and the Locks, and the Rousseau of the world, uh, you know, Marquis de Condorcet and Adam Smith. Um, but there's also a kind of rebellious trend, which is not so engaged. I mean, these are the primitive rebels, as, as Eric Hobsbawm puts it. And, and that's making a part. And then you see, if you take, I think, probably the most underestimated of the uh, 18th century intellectuals, yeah. uh, namely Mary Wollstonecraft, not only the pioneering feminist, but she's a president both. And one side in her writings, she is arguing uh, for bringing in these forces with the French constitution making it overlooking after the revolution and yet also see drawing on that. So I think that's the situation we're in. So I, I hate the word what am I can use, I hear you, but I have to use it, that is I understand you. But I'm not as wired, just that I'm not as frightened as my friend Fulsatum is, though I recognize his concern. I, I'm not frightened, we will win this one, but we won't win it without actually engaging. Sir, we have other questions also. Now, Urmilesh, Patrakar, Prasiddh Patrakar Urmilesh. And I will give you all the questions that you have to ask. I have, sir, a very two little questions. Okay. Uh, the first question relates to your book, Argumentative Indian. Yes. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, it's a great book, and we are, are all Thank you. Uh, love that book. After disintegration of Buddhism in India, the way uh, Brahminism uh, revived and consolidated its position, a lot of you know uh, of will and lot of resistances, battles, and uh, I mean struggles took place, and that reflected in writings, dialogue, and arguments also. Yes. Do you think that component is little? I mean, uh, li how, uh, li some somehow missing? in your book, number one, uh, okay. uh, because we know, we, we know uh, today's relevance, if you see from Eklabya to Rohit Vemula, uh, a new Dalit discourse is emerging in India, which, is not, which, which has not become part of uh, world sociology. No. Uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you think, I yeah. mean, no. And Shall number I answer two, that or do you want to ask the second question? Yeah, the second question uh, that relates to your book, Uncertain Glory. Yeah. Uh, you have mentioned about Indian mainstream media. A, 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 yeah. I think 15, 20 pages, yeah. and it's a fantastic piece. I have, I, I, as a media person, I like it. Uh, you have also mentioned in your uh, idea of justice, uh, the concept of, very unique concept of remediable injustices. Yes. So do you think some kind of remediable justices can be possible for mainstream in India, India uh, in India, mainstream media? Yeah, I think absolutely so. And you know, one of the reasons why I, um, I, uh, despite my critique of mainstream media, I keep on writing. Uh, yesterday, Ananda Vaja Putsika and Bengal, they don't, a lot of it is vernacular. I'm yeah. afraid. You don't read it, but it is vernacular. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking in the it context can, of the book. A book, I not, know. Not no, your but the book writing. is in English. <laughs> yeah. So not I, uh, yeah. so I, I, I came out to one big interview. Uh, um, and, and, and today, a second part, a whole page. Um, I, and I, I, I'm arguing what we ought to do, how we ought to fight. Um, and uh, right now I'm writing a piece in English, which I hope one of you will publish, uh, I called the, uh, this is a talk of mine tomorrow, but it's connected with that, uh, the, uh, the centrality of the right to dissent. Um, I think we have to go on fighting. I think what I say is about middle issue. 
I would say the same here. Um, uh, yes, it's possible, and we can do it. And we will never do it if we are frightened. The, the first question is, is also a very good question, but an enormously serious question, uh, which is not easy to answer, that there is that tradition. Uh, is the Dalit tradition sufficiently captured in the book? Uh, I don't think it is. Ambedkar is all over all my writings in economics, you know, right from, uh, you know, not only Uncertain Glory, where he is a kind of hero, but also elsewhere. Uh, but I think, and I, uh, in some ways, the, um, uh, he is present in Argumentative Indian, but he could have been much bigger in that. Uh, you know, one writes a book, and, and one would like to write a better one, and so on. I think the Buddhist uh, connection with the, uh, with the underdogs of society has been underestimated a lot. Uh, and, and we face that when Nalanda is just introducing, uh, it won't be under my guardianship, because I'm no longer chancellor. But we are beginning a study of Buddhist, um, Buddhist thought and philosophy uh, uh, from uh, 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 one or two years from now. Now, among the thing is why Buddhism had this appeal. I think one reason it fell like, it spread like wildfire in the East, is not only because it brought great scholarship and a great view of disciplined thinking, but also it sympathized with people in Thailand, in, in Sumatra, in China, in Korea, in Japan. And it comes out most clearly <coughs> in the writings of Prince Otuku in 604 in Japan. He was the prince, but he, uh, he did uh, something called the Constitution of 17 Articles, saying why no ruler should rule without consulting everyone. Now, he was a Buddhist um, uh, uh, prince, and it's quite clear what the connections are. I can even point out the conversations with Ananda from which Sotoku was drawing that inspiration. So it played this part. And you see in a small way, when I was writing in the idea of justice, uh, the distinction between Niti and Naya, and I talked about Matsanaya, that's of course an old Sanskrit thought. But I think the last example of that I know is I think Dharmapal around the 10th century in Bengal. He's saying, I've conquered Bengal. I'm, I'm the Matsana is going to end. Now that, I think, is the latest example I know. Can we, can we take the next question, sir? I'm yeah, sorry, okay. but... So they, yeah. these are all closely connected. So thanks for asking. Uh, 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 very quickly, uh, uh, it seems to be one absence in the, the uh, impressive portraiture of argumentation in India historically is the lack of the relative absence of Indian interest and Indian discussion about what is happening in the wider world. We know Chinese scholars came to India wrote about it. We know Indians went to China. But uh, the literature that emerges from Indian travels to other regions yeah. is virtually negligible. Very, very. What accounts for this and is this a flaw, is this a is this a problem in, uh, you know, you have to come to the 19th century, perhaps the 18th, not even 18th, 19th century before you start finding Indians engaging with right. uh, outside concepts, outside regions, outside yeah. problems. Uh, Islam and Christianity come to India virtually contemporaneously with uh, the life of Jesus Christ and Prophet Muhammad come to Kerala. But uh, you don't find a reflection of, or engagement with those ideas or thoughts uh, where is the problem in this? And why, yeah, wh why yeah. don't we find this? <laughs> uh, so that's it's an it's a excellent question. I should have not expected anything else. But I accept the point you're making and also dispute it. At some level, certainly on the religious level, I think the Indians felt very much on the top of the world. And they've, you know, gone this way, gone that way, etc. And when foreign language, uh, uh, religion came, we made a little room for them. So we made a little room for them, and we 
just left them there. So they're Christian, they're Jews, and they're early Muslims, well before the conquest. Accommodated them, but then we didn't absorb them in any way. That certainly is argumentation, and I say something on that here. But at one level, Indian intellectuals were very deeply engaged uh, on this subject. The great period of Indian mathematics is not contrary to uh, claim the Vedic period. The interesting things, I spent a lot of time in Atharvaveda doing, uh, doing the little riddles. They're fun. But the real thing happened only after the Babylonian thought arrived in India. Yeah. And that changed it. Aryabhats was strongly influenced. Brahmagupta, Bahama, changed the nature. Bhaskar changed the nature of Indian math. It threw up quite a bit of Indian science as well. Our astronomical thing, while we're giving math to the Chinese, we're picking up observational thing from the Chinese to here. So I think there is a, um, I think we do an injustice to us saying we are not being interested. The, possibly the best book ever written in, on India was written more than a thousand years ago, namely Al Biruni's Tariq Al Hind, where he discusses India and he says, you know, uh, one side they're so interested in everything. Uh, on the other hand, yeah. there is a inherent tendency partly connected with their social structure and religious structure that they don't want to listen to other people. <laughs> we, we never produce our own yeah. Al-Biruni. Yeah. No, we didn't. So, and, so. and he says, also he says, for example, he takes Brahma Gupta to task, saying, look, you criticize Aryabhat for being an apostate. Just to make a quick point on, on uh, Al-Biruni's thing, he's commenting on Brahma Gupta using Aryabhat's math, and at the same time criticizing Aryabhat for not being an orthodox. And there's a lovely passage in that book, and he said, I would like to whisper, I mean, he's been dead 500 years, <laughs> on his ears to say, if you really think so well, of the, so badly of the apostasy of Aryabhat, why is it that you follow him? when it comes to predicting eclipses and all other phenomena. Isn't there a duality? That duality is present in India. It's not completely ignoring something, but there is a duality, and you're absolutely right. And since Purushatnam has already said writing a, uh, writing a memoir, you're going to be quite a lot on that. <laughs> My name is Hemant. Sir, don't you think our education system today is not be able to manufacture healthy, argumentative Indians? Thank you. Just a minute, sir. Just a minute. Let, let us take a couple of questions. Okay. Yes, please. Hi, sir. My name is Shruti. My question is pretty broad, but who can be more appropriate to ask this question from? So my question is, how do you see India in the future? And also, what according to you are the biggest roadblocks in Indian development? As people claim that uh, inequality is the biggest roadblock in Indian development. So what are your viewpoint on that? Sir, I'm referring to Thomas Piketty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hi, my name is Ritambhara. I'm an aspiring filmmaker. So my question is that you have said in your book that India has had a tradition of debating. And you just said that in order to change things, one needs to engage with them. Do you think that both these statements hold true for today's youth, especially considering that demographically India is, con uh, is said to be a young nation? So the question to begin yeah, with the no, last. I, I, I'll go backwards, may I? Yeah, please. The last question, easy to answer. Yes, I, I do think it's still true. But uh, I can see why you're asking the question. But being young doesn't mean you're not questioning. In fact, uh, since I've been, you know, I'm 82 now. I started teaching when I was 22. So I've taught for 60 years. <laughs> the most radical question <coughs> comes from the youngest. They have the ability to dream. So India being young makes it even more argumentative. So let's uh, but not that worry is a about that. related question about education system, health of the education now, that system. That I'm coming to. Yeah. Now, your question was inequality. Inequality. Yeah. Okay, inequality. Yeah. I, I would say that you're absolutely right. But you know, I would draw a line. I mean, I've spent half my life working on inequality. I've got two books called Inequality. 
but on, uh, on economic inequality, inequality will examine. The fact is that not all inequalities are as harmful as others. I think ultimately the thing that we most concentrate on income inequality of income makes a difference and well when they are used for example for election and in America too but in India too I mean the asymmetry of power of the different political parties was radical in the last general election. However the biggest inequality is the inequality of education and healthcare and that's why China despite having huge inequality of income, could be, and, and no less than in India, maybe more, scores a point above it because there's not so much, it, everyone's literate, everyone has a hospital to go to, makes a big difference. And I think the question that I think somebody asked, uh, the first question uh, you did. Uh, Health of he, the institutions. Heman, did you say what? Heman, Heman. Heman, Heman. So Heman, I would say, that it's not just the college education you're looking at. You know, we live in a country where about 70% of the people are excluded when they're children. It's amazing that we still produce great scientists, great poets, great mathematicians out of the 30%. Just imagine what would happen yeah. if we had the 70%. Right. And that also applies to arguments of different kinds, the originality, how to deal with. So I think we have to argue, yes, indeed, at a higher level, and Paul Sutton has already raised that question earlier, and that's there. But also the neglect of basic education is an enormously uh, harmful thing Thank you, sir. For, for the whole Thank thing you. in India. Mr. Gurdip Singh Sappal. Uh, I agree with your assessment that youth is asking questions. Hmm. Are you worried that there are not enough people or medium or occasions to answer the questions being put up by the youth? Yes. And whose responsibility is it? Yeah. I, I'm not, not so much that there are not enough people. Demographically, we have every kind of <laughs> people <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> it's just that they're not getting the kind of attention that they should yeah. do. Uh, I think, uh, I am worried. And a part, I think you raised the question about part of the problem about uh, my critique of media is that media often ignores a uh, very serious question that being raised and instead goes off at a tangent on other things which are easier to discuss, on which data exist and if uh, you know, someone could write a good, uh, good uh, Bengali word, Pramanya, Sanskrit <laughs> <or> two, <laughs> article on that. And I think I am worried, but not demographically. I am worried about lack of attention. We ought to listen a bit more. ये बहुत दिलचस्प बात है कि सवाल पूछने वाले भी हैं सवाल देने वाले भी हैं लेकिन उनके माध्यम और अवसर संभवतः कम हैं शायद ये प्रोग्राम राज्यसभा टीवी का किताब एक ऐसा माध्यम बन सके जिसमें सवाल पूछे जा सकें और प्रोफेसर सैन जैसे विद्वानों से हम बात करके कुछ जवाबों को खोजने की कोशिश कर सकें अब आखिर में इस किताब के बारे में आपकी राय अगर आपने ये किताब पढ़ी है या इस प्रोग्राम के बाद ये किताब पढ़ने में आपकी दिलचस्पी जागती है तो हम चाहेंगे कि आप अपनी राय हमें हमारे फेसबुक पेज फेसबुक डॉट कॉम राज्यसभा टी पर भेज सकते हैं हमारे ट्विटर हैंडल एट राज्यसभा टी पर हैश टैग किताब ऑन आर पर ट्वीट कर सकते हैं और ये राय हमारे लिए महत्वपूर्ण होगी आगे के कार्यक्रम डिजाइन करने के लिए और जो टिप्पणी इस किताब पर हमें सबसे अच्छी लगेगी उसे राज्यसभा टीवी की ओर से उपहार दिया जाएगा और निश्चिंत रहिए उपहार में किताबें ही दी जाएंगी बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद अगले सप्ताह में फिर किसी और महत्वपूर्ण किताब पर किसी और महत्वपूर्ण व्यक्ति से बात करेंगे तब तक के लिए नमस्कार